Good morning. I look around here and I, I see people that I haven't seen in quite some time. It, better looking, Larry. We're a lot better looking now than we used to be. Yeah, and smart. Also look around and I see, uh, is this the fifth aquaculture extension conference or fourth? Dang. I, I didn't. I missed a few. But I happened to go to the first one, which is in uh, somewhere in Arkansas. Yep. And I learned how to two-step there. So I, B.J. Star studied Honky Tonk that had a, a semi as the dis, as like where they, the DJ played. So after a few uh, beers or Jack Daniels, I'm not sure which it was, or maybe it was both, I had the courage to get out with someone who knew how to two-step. I can't two-step anymore because I think that was the only time I ever did it. But I, I certainly hope y'all had as much fun doing things like that last night or tonight or tomorrow night as we did back in 91. Uh, this is one of the best meetings I've ever been to, and it's unfortunate I don't get a chance to do it more often. I'm going to give how many people have been in extension for less than five years? Good. I'm going to give you the same advice that old county agent gave me in Alabama back in 85. And I've tried to rip this apart and rebuild it with better things, but it doesn't get any better than this. So if you, you know, if you haven't figured this out, these are seven rules of extension that you probably should live by. I'm not going to read those. Another thing, reason why I love extension so much, and I, I've learned about this, and one of the reasons I don't do as much, and we'll talk more about the role that Air Program Mississippi Alabama has in aquaculture in the Gulf at some point is that we can't seem to get out of our own way when it comes to disasters in the Gulf of Mexico. In 2005, we had Hurricane Ivan, which pretty much whacked where I live in Alabama. And then 2006, we had Katrina. 2010, we had the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. The Deepwater Horizon is where I really learned the value of trust and why extension is an organization that really uh, is trusted. You are a boundary organization, and the fact that extension is trusted. You know, you say you got to be trusted, and it's taken me some time, and this is not original, so I, but I don't know where I got it. Uh, what is trust? And there's really a couple ways. I mean, you're, you, you may have a research appointment. You may have an extension appointment. You may only have an extension appointment. But you really look at two areas in trust. It's either it's your character and it's your competence. And you can go down to the different levels in there. I'm not going to do that. But I wanted to make sure, share with you what I've learned when people say, why, why do you go to extension? It, well, you're a trusted organization. Well, there, it's a little deeper than just being trusted. You don't just, somebody doesn't just start trusting you. You build trust. And here are some of the things that, you know, if you, you probably look at this and see yourself in a lot of those, I'm really good in this area. Um, maybe I could do a little bit better in these other areas. But it is being trusted is not an easy thing to achieve. That's not why I came. And uh, I came to talk about a 10-year aquaculture vision that we put together. It, it's actually in its second year uh, for the Sea Grant Association and Sea Grant. You know, we've all been involved in various planning efforts strategic plans, and I'm not exactly sure if I know the difference between a vision and a strategic plan, except that a vision is a lot more fun to put together in a strategic plan because you can just kind of brainstorm and say this is where, where we've been, this is where we probably need to go in big, big, big terms. But we at Sea Grant, we, we decided we needed a vision because, as you probably have heard, Sea Grant is eliminated just like the racks are, which I think is just, you know, it, the reason the regional aquaculture centers and Sea Grant are eliminated, probably the same, that we provide support for developing industries. Not something that, you know, not something that evidently um, is as high a priority as it used to be. But we do create jobs. Sea Grant does. USDA creates a lot of jobs. And so the, before this year, Sea Grant's aquaculture budget was going up incrementally without even trying. We tried all these other initiatives, resilience, whatever, tourism, all these other things, and probably didn't make as much traction as we wanted to. But we were getting bumps in, in aquaculture money without really trying. And, and finally, maybe Delight went on and said, well, maybe we should get ahead of this. 
and start thinking about what we need to do from a vision standpoint on how we would invest these new resources and hopefully obtain even more resources. You know, we've heard all this, you know, $18 billion, give or take a billion or two trade deficit. No aquaculture by name, invest roughly $20 million in aquaculture. Nine and a half of that is in Sea Grant, the remainders in the Office of Aquaculture. There are other programs that probably contribute, but by name, that's roughly it. I don't know if that's a good amount or a bad amount, but for some reason, we're not chipping away at that trade deficit the way we should. So what we did, and I, I chaired this group, and I reached around and, and people I've known uh, for some time, and so, you know, I may have chaired it, and I'm not going to go through the list. Many of the names on that list are here. I really appreciate it. There was some heavy lifting done by this committee in a short period of time uh, to put together a document that's pretty brief. I have one copy here. It's online. Uh, you can find that. <clears throat> but simple vision is, and this is not a foreign language to you, is it's the integration. I would underscore the integration of the research, outreach, and education in creating and applying aquaculture products, tools, and services to expand the sustainable marine and Great Lakes aquaculture industry. The way we went about <coughs> identif <coughs> excuse me, identifying some of these priorities is through an internal online survey. We obtained 153 responses from Sea Grant and other groups that were involved. Three main, four main questions. One was aquaculture related issues. Sea Grant's role in addressing those issues and beyond funding and if you're a nutritionist you learned a long time ago never answer liver and eggs on the test because it's always right same way we don't generally don't say well more funding will solve the problem well I don't know that that's always right so beyond funding what other resources are needed and then kind of brainstorm some ideal impacts what we realize with when you only have Sea Grant only has nine and a half million for a national strategic investment, and that doesn't count probably the other four and a half that state programs invest in aquaculture. You have to you have to make stone soup, and we've done pretty good at doing that in some areas, and maybe not so good in other areas. And these are the usual suspects. You know, you know we've known this. I've been working, spent ten years in Illinois, Indiana as an aquaculture specialist. Uh, these it's kind of like. Uh, uh, watching, I told this earlier, Crocodile Dundee, any of you old enough to remember that movie? There is a line in there that pretty much mirrors aquaculture and it's when uh, Nick was in the hotel room and the, the lady was in the bathroom saying go ahead and turn the TV on and you know this guy comes out of the outback and probably never seen a TV or sees one every 20 or 30 years, he flips it on and it was a 1950s rerun of I Love Lucy. He says oh yeah I've seen this before. So it's kind of like a soap opera or, or that. If you just flip it on, things don't appear to have changed very much in 20 or 30 years. The same applies here. You know, we have, you know, new faces in a lot of these offices. We have new energy in a lot of these offices, and, and we're making progress. Uh, but I do believe that, you know, it's been my observation, we're not going to make enough progress unless we really take these collaborations, the, these partnership opportunities, uh, more seriously than maybe we have. <clears throat> Some of the things that we found through the survey, I like word clouds. It allows you to whip out kind of the big picture sorts of things that we saw through the survey. So that was kind of the big things and the big, the big text is kind of like the major themes or focus areas and the smaller are some of the th sub things, sub themes. We came out with this, commerce, permitting and policy, current emerging species, production systems and seafood safety and quality. So what I would like to do is step through some of the primary uh, priorities and, and recommendations in each of those and then kind of conclude with, you know, some of the guiding principles and how you tie some of those things together. So the priority for commerce is, and Flamito, you're here somewhere. So we have really good people heading these up. Provide economic and marketing research associated with outreach program and increase profitability and environmental sustainability of aquaculture businesses. You know, what we've seen, and we work a lot, and there are many parallels between aquaculture and commercial record, commercial fishing, and I've seen that now in the Gulf over the last 17 years. You know, they deal with, you know, commercial fishing deals with many of the same 
issues that the aquaculture industry deals with. Certainly commerce is one of those. Uh, but we have to do a better job of, of putting together and, and together business plans and models and integrate those into those farms. You know, I, I'd like to think that you go to a farm now in Kentucky and you know, an aquaculture producer has a really well laid out QuickBooks or business plan, but I doubt it. All of them, they probably still keep them in shoe boxes or, you know, some manila folders that are stuck in some milk crate somewhere and they pull them out when they need them. So that's, you know, that's not very resilient. I'm not picking on Kentucky uh, too much because I grew up in Tennessee and you better be careful when you pick on one state that's next to another state. But certainly commerce. You know, look at international trade. We do have $18 billion trade deficit. You know, how do we deal with that? How do, how do we, how do we, not only the imports, but how do we do a better job of exporting? You know, a lot of people eat sea, seaweed. I don't. So I'm glad that California and the Northeast grow a lot of seaweed, and I hope you export the dickens out of that. But so it's not just <laughs> stuff coming in, it's stuff going out. So how do we, how do we work with international trade issues to figure that out? You know, I'm not going to read through those line by line, but certainly niche markets. You know, we, you know, there's a lot of, uh, what do you call it, local slow food instead of fast food. There's a lot of different names. We'll call it slow food. So the opportunity there is for aquaculture where you develop those niche markets and, you know, things where you buy from Pond Bank or whatever, things we've been talking about for a long time and maybe the rest of the world from terms of slow foods catching up with the aquaculture industry. It's really an opportunity to take advantage of that now. Permitting and policy, and this is really the one that I think just wears us out. You know, when I, the thing that we dealt with, and I'll give you an example. We, uh, we're fortunate to have 13 oyster farms worth about $3 million. It doesn't sound like much, but that's a, in Alabama, that's a big step forward compared to where we were pre-2009. One of the first things that we had to deal with was a permitting process that was going to cost a farmer roughly $2,000 an acre. By getting these folks together, and this is public water, so it's, it's, that's a challenge in itself. Uh, to, so we got the agencies together, Bill Walton with Auburn University funded through Sea Grant, really has done a, a, r a very good job of getting that down to roughly $250 an acre. And that's far more affordable for a farmer. Getting in. They have other things they need to spend money on. That's really not one of them, especially when you're growing an organism that improves the environment instead of degrades the environment. Some of the common policies, you know, outreach, tech, provide that technical assistance. Facilitate, and you're going to see the word facilitate, coordinate far more, a lot more, and that's really a strength of extension. Extension does a great job of facilitating and coordinating. So that, that some of the things would we can do. Outreach programs, legal responsibility to state managers and public trust in land waters. This is one thing that marine aquaculture deals with that land base doesn't have such a challenge and that's that's we're growing animals in public waters so you do get the opportunity everyone who has an opinion is going to express it and how do you deal with that those sorts of things and how how do you you know how do managers deal with public trust waters. You know, in balancing the multiple uses, we have uh, coastal zone management, we have uh, land, land use, uh, coastal zone planning, marine spatial planning, I get the right word, uh, where you have navigation routes, oil and gas rigs, you have a lot of things in the Gulf of Mexico that's competing for that space. So when you, you think about how big the Gulf of Mexico is, it's really, once you take, subtract out what's already been used, there's not so much space that, that you can put it anywhere. Current emerging species, key things that we've heard about, nutrition, reproduction, larval rearing, genomics, you know, ha hatchery production of shellfish, macroalgae, and, and finfish, we can improve in all those areas, not only for the emerging, uh, but uh, the current as well. Uh, you know, look for sustainable alternatives. You know, the one, I, I don't know, I think I had a cobia there. Let me go back. I like cobia. If you like to fish, cobia is a fun fish to catch too and they're very good to eat. You know, and of all the species we hear in the Gulf, you know, what is it? Red drum, cobia, pompano, name, name your fish. Yellowtail, you know, I hear someone name another one. You know, there's probably 20 or 30 potential marine aquaculture species. And that's all we need to invest 
research dollars in those. But I also think we have to pick out, you know, three or four and say, let's really focus on these. And I'll vote for Cobia and Pompano, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done in those areas. Production systems, I go back, and I was joking about seaweed. Actually, they serve seaweed in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. If you go to the right restaurant, it's pretty good. But I'm, you know, Sea Grant has played a role in developing, you know, seaweed aquaculture. I'd like to think the partnership with USDA and Sea Grant has played a pretty good role in developing the striped bass industry as well. Uh, there are other examples besides what we're recognizing that for doing, and that's with shellfish aquaculture. Yeah, how do we optimize? You know, I was hired to go on the work for Illinois, Indiana, because at the time there was an economic crisis, you know, recession, hog farmers were going out of business, going out of business, and uh, so they said, we'll just hire an extension specialist, come in and save all the hog farms in Illinois, Indiana. Yeah, we'll turn those, those waste pits underneath those slats into biofilters and put some tanks on top of those and they'll grow everything from tilapia to shrimp to striped bass and all these things. And, you know, everything's going to be just peachy and all these, you know, these people are really suffering. These farmers, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do fine. Well, I, I don't know if they're doing fine or not, but I, I can say this, you know, we have to fish or cut bait with that. There's been a lot of improvements in recirculating technology. I don't know if it's I Love Lucy all over again. We know we can grow fish in recirculating systems. The question is, how do we make it profitable for the people? So it goes back to the combination of production methods research. We have to do a better job with that, as well as economic research and the marketing research. Seafood safety and quality. I heard John mention methylmercury. Uh, when I moved to the Gulf Coast, I, I fish. I like to fish. I like to think I, I can fish. And I, it was like a kid in a candy store. I grew up catching bass and bluegill in Tennessee and other areas and go down there and you're catching 20, 30 pound king mackerel. You know, I was eating everything. I ate a Jack Crevel. Anyone ever eaten a Jack Crevel? It's, they're really good smoked. But I tell you what, I had the dubious honor of having, having the highest methyl, methylmercury levels of anyone of a hundred people they tested. So all the species that you probably shouldn't be eating, I was eating them and I was loving them. So I had like 13 parts per million in my hair and I don't think that's the reason my hair fell out. So, you know, we put on, we did a lot of work, a lot of outreach and had uh, Senator Sessions come in. But John, the whole thing about selenium has been an antagonist to methylmercury. I knew about that 17 years ago. And if I didn't, I'd probably be freaking out because I'm thinking, I, you know, my IQ's lower than it already is. So, you know, there are a lot of things that, that has, we've learned through the research and certainly seafood safety. You know, in the Gulf, we're dealing with, uh, you know, Vibrio, nor norovirus. I mean, you look at a lot of the, you know, a lot of the shellfish production right now. You know, I'll say climate change. You know, how do we adapt? And I, I could care less politically about climate change, but I care a great deal about what extension does to make sure farmers are, can adapt to it. You know, uh, Vibrio parahemolyticus is a good example of one that does you know, thrives in warmer waters. And, you know, I know Alaska, I don't know if anyone hears from Alaska, the way they dealt with that was just lowering it uh, into deeper water so it is, didn't get as warm. So there's a lot of things, very practical stuff that Extension does. We need to do more of that. You know, HACCP is something that Sea Grant deals with a great deal, the consumer education. You know, I think the first speaker with the, uh, where'd you go? Well, anyway. Jerry's a good guy, a friend of mine. So I I'm, I'm really appreciate that consumer safety education programs. I mean, that's a great opportunity to partner with Sea Grant for us to partner with, with you and other programs to do those sorts of things. And then product diversity. You know, we went a long time in the Mississippi and Alabama without a lot of interest. We had HACCP certified people. They weren't that interested. Now they're interested because they're adding new product lines. And so, you know, we HACCP is a big part of what Sea Grant's done, and I'm sure it will continue to do that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in that, but it is a little matrix in some of the areas that, you know, maybe some of the resources should be invested in for research outreach and then how we go about building some of those partnerships. You know, this thing, and yeah, this is something I did in Word, so it's not high tech, but it, you know, and I, I put it out for review, and Paul didn't have any comment. Paul 
Olin said, looks good to me, but it really kind of ties it together. The backdrop here is coordination with partners. You know, and then we have translational research and applied research, technology transfer feeding into the cycle where everything revolves around commerce, but it's all connected to these other, these other four corners. You know, just quickly measures of success. If we, if we do a good job, we increase jobs, we increase aquaculture production, create new markets, all those positive things we're looking for. Uh, if we do a good job, kind of the reverse of that, we'll, we'll uh, decrease the national seafood trade deficit. And the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, has said that he can't, what was he said? He's puzzled or doesn't understand why we have such a large seafood trade deficit. I think the Secretary needs to name a seafood czar, right? We have an office of aquaculture. We need a seafood czar within commerce. Gene, we need a seafood czar within USDA. We need about $1 billion of research and extension money. And then turn those two czars loose to do what needs to happen to make this industry grow the way it, way it should grow. Whew. One billion, is that a good number? Yeah. And just some guiding principles. I mean, we've seen this along. I mean, we're dealing with big head carp in Appalachian, uh, Chaflai River Basin. We have to make better decisions when we do things with aquaculture. You know, I know and I grew up in that era where, you know, we should be allowed to do anything we want. I'm not so sure that I agree with that the way I did early on. I'm not saying we can't do anything we want. We just need to think it through and look for those unintended consequences before we do that. And the, you know, the one thing that I think that we'd like to see from investment in Sea Grant is some large-scale demonstration projects around the region that would involve extension folks and, and scientists in the industry. So not so much about that, but uh, that's, that's it, Gary kind of went through that pretty quick, and I hope we have a time for a question or two. Oh, yeah, we, got, we have questions. We got about five minutes for questions. I sure will. I'll try. I don't know if I have an answer on how to buy in, but I can share a concern that was shared with me probably the first year that uh, I worked in Mississippi and Alabama. You know, I came down there being known as someone that, that worked in aquaculture who was supposed to be working with the shrimp fishermen and all the other people. Their number one concern at that time was to see the aquaculture industry, let's say shrimp, to be so vertically integrated there was no, there was no room left for the, you know, the closely held family run business. And so I think that's a concern, concern that we need to, to work on. How do we deal with that? Uh, you know, I think these demonstration projects is another way, and I'll give you an example. It's kind of silly, but we started, it's not a silly program, silly how it, it worked. Uh, we have an oyster gardening program, kind of like a master gardening program you may be familiar with. And two of those eight, 13 farmers in Alabama kind of came from oyster gardening, which is they grew up. 200 oysters a year, 300, learned kind of fundamentals, and then, you know, some of those people, those two out of 60, decided they wanted to pursue oyster farming. So I think bringing them in, showing them, we do, a, we, we've worked hard to show the oyster people, you know, we have a wild harvest oyster, like, like you do too, show those wild harvesters, and they are wild harvesters, show those harvesters who catch wild oysters what it looks like to be on a farm. And so, that's one way. I mean, I think classic things that Extension does so well to show people uh, what it looks like to be success, successful. Uh, but the concern that, that the real, a big concern is, you know, are you going to, are they going to be left in the dust as an aquaculture industry comes online? And that's a very real concern. It's not an either or, it's, it's both. So that's, you know, I don't know if that doesn't answer your question, but it's some things we've seen. I, I forgot this. No, any other questions? Going back to Eric. <coughs> well, John, um, many of us have been waiting for the GU um, opening. Uh, for our
Well, we got rid of Andy out of FDA, so that's probably a good start. No, Andy works at DePaola as a microbiologist, my neighbor that I've known a long time. And, you know, he pushes things. He's now an oyster farmer, by the way. Uh, you, know, you know, that's maybe we need an executive order. Yeah, I don't know. Everything boils down to executive orders these days. But I do think that need, it's political to some degree. I don't know why it hasn't opened, but certainly it's a problem. And, you know, when it's on the Hill with the Gulf Forester Industry Council is more about their imports, you know, concerns than exports. Maybe the Gulf doesn't export much, but that, I, I don't know. Did you get that question? Some of the new skills that extension people need to be incorporating into their toolkit. Was that roughly it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> the answer is always going to be Instagram and Facebook, right, and Twitter. <laughs> but those social media is certainly certainly an option. You know, and the opportunity we have, you know, there's one called Saltwater Fanatics right now. And it's all about the protest of the red snapper season in the, in the Gulf. And I got a 20-year-old son that fishes. He is a fishing fanatic. And he said he's going to, he's so tired of hearing this. And this kind of reminds me of some of the NGO stuff I heard during the oil spill, that he's going to start a Facebook page that says, shut up and fish. And, you know, it's kind of like that. I mean, you, you have to figure out how to communicate in a very positive way and a, a trusted way. You know, the challenge is sometimes you can't truth your way out of something. And so to have social media like that is certainly one way. Uh, you know, it used to be video conferencing, the World Wide Web, all these things. It's, it's an evolution. But, I, you know, fundament, good, solid, fundamental extension things, are, are, we need those. And I, I'm a firm believer in demonstration projects. You know, I think that's one thing. If we could get the resources to do various demonstration projects, not only do the demonstration projects, but have the resources to bring people to those, uh, to see those and maybe spend a week, days there and learning. I think demonstration sites is, you know, a classic extension thing that I don't think we should get too far away from. Thank you very much. Yep, Brian. thank you.